okay revealed preferences so for revealed preferences we saw that the idea is that if in some setting if the guy consumed bundle a and the prices are such that the budget line through a would look like this and suppose there was some other bundle b which is inside the budget line okay you know suppose you are amazon okay suppose you are amazon so you know what bundle any guy buys x a comma y a you know the prices of p x and p y so you can construct the bundle so you know that if i purchase this bundle in this year then this another bundle b was also affordable to me but i did not buy this bundle okay so to give you an example suppose i buy an iphone and a windows laptop at the same budget i could have purchased an android phone and a mac but suppose you you know this fact that iphone plus windows laptop costs at least as much as android phone plus a mac so you purchase this bundle and not this which means that the combo of iphone and windows laptop let me call it at bundle a and this is bundle b so it means that a must be at least as preferred to be for you okay so since you purchased a when b was affordable a should be at least as uh, preferred to you as okay so that is revealed preferences now revealed preferences says that if in some setting it has been found that a bundle a is more preferred to bundle b then even if prices change you should never be finding out that b now becomes more preferred to a so there should not be some other setting like uh, this wherein you find that a and b are both affordable but the cons consumer goes with b so that should not happen as long as they are both affordable the consumer should always buy a over b so that is revealed preferences so we say that in a setting like this when consumer buys a when b was affordable so if a consumer buys a bundle a when b is affordable then a is revealed preferred to b now weak axiom of revealed preferences says that if a and b look like this okay sorry a is purchased when b was affordable then this must be true so this is weak axiom of revealed preferences strong axiom says that if a and b are both affordable and a was purchased then a must strictly be as preferred to b so this is strong axiom of so let us look at this uh, so the in the strong axiom you can even apply transitivity what transitivity says is that in some setting you find a was preferred to b in some other setting you find b was preferred to c and in some other setting you find c was preferred to d then it basically implies that a should also be preferred to b so this transitivity relationship is something which uh which is the result of strong action of the all right now let's look at this problem so over a three year period an individual exhibits the following consumption behavior he purchases when the prices are this he purchases this bundle in year 1 year 2 so i want to check if this behavior is consistent with strong axiom of revealed preferences or not so let me just copy this question
let's look at the year one case let me call this as bundle a bundle b bundle c years are one two and three so expenditure in year one of bundle a expenditure in year one on bundle a this is basically when the prices are three comma three and you buy this bundle so this is going to be three times seven plus three times four so three px times x py times y so this is equal to what uh, three into seven is 21 plus four threes are 12 so 30 so you made an actual expenditure of 33 rupees in year one now in year one if you were to buy bundle b what would have been the expenditure so now instead of focusing on bundle a focus on bundle b in the same year year one okay so three comp three into six plus three into six So that is going to be equal to 36, which means that bundle B was costlier than A in year one. So I cannot compare when a bundle is costlier. When a bundle is costlier, you could have not bought it because it was costlier or, or it was not affordable, or you could not have bought it because you did not like that bundle. I cannot compare when a bundle is costlier. Let's compare bundle C in year one. Okay, so that is going to be three comma seven into three comma three. Sorry, three into seven plus three into three. So that is going to be equal to uh, twenty one plus nine. So that is thirty. So bundle C was cheaper than A in year one. So what I can comment here is that since C was cheaper, but A was purchased, A must be strictly preferred to C. Since I'm applying strong action, A turns out to be strictly preferred than C. Now let's do the analysis for year two. You are going to do this for me. And I'm going to ask you the question. So I hope you're sitting with the notebook. Okay, I'm going to go over problems one by one. First of all, what is the expenditure? The purchased bundle is bundle B, right? So Himanti, what is the expenditure? This is the purchased bundle. So Himandi, what is expenditure in year two on bundle B, which is the true expenditure? Uh, six into four plus uh, six into two. Yeah, yeah. So that is equal to 36. So this is the expenditure done. Uh, Vijay, what is the expenditure in year two if he were to buy bundle A? Hello, Vijay. Yes, uh, 39. Yeah. 39. Okay. And uh, Vinay, what is the expenditure in year two if we were to buy bundle C? So 6 into 5 plus 6 into 1. No. Wait. The, the prices are 4 and 2. Okay. Then it's uh, 28 plus 12, 40. Yes. So that is equal to 40. Okay, so we get no information from here. Is it what is expenditure in year two on bundle A? Four into seven. So it's, I did it for year three, sir. Okay, so you made a mistake, right? Okay, so four into seven plus two into four. So that is equal to 28 plus eight. So that is equal to 36. Right? So, you actually, by looking at these three numbers, on B was the actual purchase bundle, okay? A and C were the alternatives which were not picked. So, by looking at these expenditure numbers, 
what kind of relationship can you tell me about a b and c sir a and b have uh, weak axiom preferred so just give me what is more preferred than what i am only going to okay let's look at b and a first by looking at these numbers since b was picked even though it had the same expenditure what can so you say b about b has b was weakly preferred over a very good so since we are doing with strong axiom i'm going to put this strictly preferred sign and what can you say about b and c you ask sir b was strictly preferred over c no you cannot compare here because expenditure of c was larger so if for something was more expensive and and i didn't buy it i cannot compare it all right so look at this graph okay this was my budget line and this is the bundle i purchased so this is let's say my bundle b now my bundle a is clearly here which is same expenditure but i did not buy it so it has to be below my ic but my bundle c it could be here when it is see it is expensive so it could be above the budget line and still below the ic or it could be here where in where it is above the indifference curve so i cannot say conclusively about c so whenever a bundle is costlier i am not going to say anything about it all right so i hope you guys get the point because the third part is coming up and i am not going to pick my pen for this so please i want all of you guys to focus on your three now and tell me what relationship can you draw on bundles a b and c when you focus on your three no see fast answers don't get marks okay correct answers get marks so try to be correct no need to rush with an answer C is the actual purchased bundle. so c is prefer to b so vinay's answer is 
So that's the only relation you're getting. Yes, sir. Since I got E three A as thirty nine, so it was more expensive. Yes, you actually want to give an answer. Yes, sir. Same. Same. same okay. So you actually and when I have this answer, I'm waiting for the one with M B three. Yeah, same answer actually. Okay. She. All right. We have the same answer as well. So, are you waiting for minus? Yeah. The same answer. Okay. 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 All right. So I have to get the same answer. So now let's look at what happens. Okay. So all your answers are correct. This is the only outcome which will come from this. So the first result I had was A preferred to C. The second result was B preferred to A. Okay. So let me just write them down. So the first result was okay. Hold on. A preferred to C. Second result was B preferred to A. Now, if I apply transitivity on these first two results, what I'll get is B is preferred to A, which is preferred to C, which implies B is preferred to C, which is in contradiction to this result. Okay, so these two things contradict each other. So that's why uh, this guy's preferences they don't obey the weak axiom or sorry the strong axiom of repeated preferences. Okay, so this was the question. Question is the behavior consistent with strong axiom of repeated preferences? The answer is no, because we are getting contradictory results. Okay. All right. Uh, then there are a bunch of problems for you to work out and this will basically wrap up my entire thing. As you can see, a very popular topic, consumer theory. A lot of problems have been asked in the past from both DSE and ISI. And that's why it took us the longest time to cover this. Also because there are a lot of concepts which are new here. Now, I would request you all to basically revise the videos again because uh, a lot of things that we are going to do now are going to be dependent on these things. So if you're good with uh, consumer theory, you will not have a lot of issues with uh, uh, the subsequent topics which are going to come. The most related topic to this one is going to be the right that this topic, the next topic, itself, which is going to be production theory. So in production theory, we are going to see a lot of concepts which are going to be similar. So we'll basically breeze through this topic. Okay, so the first thing for production function is that we have a, so production theory is that we have a production function, which is basically a quantity that you can produce given some levels of input. So K could be capital, L is labor, M could be amount of electricity you're consuming, N could be amount of fuel you're burning, and all sorts of other things. So any production happens, uh, what does production do? What does any factory do? A factory is basically a place which takes some inputs and at some cost converts them into some output. which are then sold into the market. That is essentially the work of a factory. So this is a production function. In general, we'll just assume two, uh, two inputs. The inputs are going to be capital, represented by K, and labor, represented by M. Okay? Now, the production function has an analogous concept in consumer theory, which is known as utility function. 
So everything about production function is similar to utility function. With a major caveat that utility functions are uh, ordinal. That is, are not, or, are not ordinal, sorry. Uh, that is, they, the number, utility number does not represent anything. I multiply any utility by two, utility function by two. The new function will also be a utility function. So if u is a utility function, then two times u is also a utility function. So if u is a utility function, two times u is also a utility function. And uh, the same does not hold for production. Production functions cannot be multiplied by two to give the same result because production function is something which is giving an output something tangible, the amount of output at your GPT. Let's say you're talking about production of mobile phones. So you cannot just multiply the production function by two and say this is also a valid production function because products are tangible, utilities are not. Okay, so you cannot just uh, multiply production functions by any factor and still work with them. So production functions are something real, so you cannot do monotony transformation. Like that. Then we talk about marginal productivity. So marginal productivity of any input is the additional output that can be produced by employing one more unit of the input while holding all the other inputs constant. This is a very important concept. The reason is, uh, Suppose you have a factory which has some utility function, uh, sorry, some production function. So suppose you have some production function Q equals to some F of A comma L. Okay, now somebody comes up to you and says, okay, I am also, I also want work. I want to work for your firm and uh, and he's willing to work for you for let's say 10,000 rupees a month. He says, to give me 10,000 rupees per month, I'm going to work for you. So at that point, what you look at is keeping everything is else constant. How is this new employee going to change my revenues? And revenues can change only if you, he changes your quantity. So you're going to look at del Q by del L first of all. And then this is basically the change in output uh, by hiring this guy. Now if this change in output will result, how much money value will it result in? That is something we'll have to see in later chapters. That will depend on if you're a monopoly, if you're a oligopoly or if you're a, uh, if you're a, a competitive firm. So that will depend on the market structure, how a change in quantity really causes a change in revenue. So I'm not going to look into that right now. What I'm interested right now is how does the quantity change with an additional unit of labor? So this is the marginal productivity of labor, which is the additional output, which this guy by starting to work with you has caused in your firm. Similarly, you have marginal productivity of capital. Suppose you were to buy one more piece of machinery. So how will that change your output? So marginal productivity is a very important uh, uh, concept. It, it takes major connotations in uh, macroeconomics. In macroeconomics, we are going to look at a lot of marginal productivities for different uh, inputs. Then diminishing marginal productivity. So this is an assumption of uh, uh, assumption we make very often. So we make the assumption that we might expect that marginal physical product of an input depends on how much of that input is used. So labor, for example, cannot be added indefinitely to a given field. So suppose you have a farm and you are hiring labor to work on that farm. You cannot keep hiring more and more labor. Ultimately, what will happen is that at some point, these labor are going to fight against each other. There's going to be no space to work. There's going to be a lot of ego clashes and whatnot. I don't know. There's going to be fights. It is going to hurt productivity. Okay. <clears throat> so that is something we don't assume, okay, that people are going to fight if you hire too many people. Okay. 
that's not the assumption here the idea is that after some point with the limited amount of capital that you have employed these labor are not going to be that so let's say you are running a carpentry workshop and you have let's say two drills and two hammer that is your that is all you have okay so let's say this is your capital key and uh, suppose you have initially you have two units of labor so each worker has his own drill has his own uh, uh, hammer so he can work perfectly efficiently suppose you take that to four labor so now there there is going to be some amount of sharing so people will probably take time uh, take turns working with drills and hammers suppose you hire 100 labor now 100 labor are sharing two drills and two hammers there is going to be a waiting line to work with hammers and drills so for the same amount of capital if you keep adding more and more labor it is not going to keep adding productivity at the same level so that is the idea for margin of uh, diminishing margin of product what it says is that marginal product is positive but it is going to be diminishing so this figure is going to explain it better than any word that i can probably say about it if you were to draw output q as a function of let's say labor keeping capital constant it would look something like this what happens at the margins is something i'm not interested in right now that will depend on the case to case basis what's happening in the intermediate zone is something interesting so this is l1 this is l1 plus epsilon this is l1 plus twice epsilon so as you see when you increase the amount of labor by epsilon first the first epsilon causes this much change in output whereas the second epsilon causes a smaller change in output a third epsilon is going to cause an even further smaller change in output so the same amount of increase in labor keeps increasing the overall output but the change in output keeps on reducing so this is the assumption of diminishing marginal productivity of labor and capital in reality what happens is that this would actually start dipping after some point like i said after some point it will start dipping but this is not an assumption we make we make the assumption that it keeps increasing but eventually it will stop the 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 slope is going to keep reducing the slope will keep on reducing so it's going to be a concave upward curve it's going to be concave upward curve now apart from uh, marginal productivity there is another concept which is average productivity so average productivity of labor is total quantity by total labor so this is average productivity now sometimes you would want to optimize average productivity sometimes you would want to optimize marginal productivity so let's look at an example and see what would you do when so suppose a firm has this production function okay suppose capital is fixed at 10 so find the marginal and average productivity of labor so q as a function of l at k equals to 10 is going to be 60000 l square minus 1000 times l okay so marginal productivity is q prime of l so you differentiate this with respect to l so you are getting 1 lakh 20000 l minus 3000 l square this is marginal okay i want to find the value of l for which marginal productivity becomes zero so for what value of l will this become zero 
that is question number one. Question number two is AP maximized. So average productivity of labor is Q by L. So you just divide this thing with respect to L. So what you're getting is 60,000 L minus 1,000 L square. So you want to look at where APL gets maximized. So to find APL max, you're going to differentiate APL with respect to L. So that is going to be 60,000 minus 2,000 L. And then you are going to equate it to C. So that is your first order condition. Okay. So, Vinay, question number one. What L makes this thing zero? And you actually, you have to answer the second part. What so L? 40. Very good. L1 equals to okay. You actually, you have to answer this part. What L makes this thing zero? You actually, are you with us? Sir, 30. Very good. So L2 equals to 30. Now the point is, when do I look at marginals? When do I look at averages? Okay, so recently, I don't know if you have been reading the news. There's a lot of, uh, uh, lot of news about uh, cooperators. So cooperators have been doing bad in the new India. Yesterday, Sharad Pawar met uh, uh, the Prime Minister to talk about cooperative. There's a bill which is being proposed to strengthen cooperative industry. So, the whole idea of cooperatives is that the people who work, the labor, are themselves the owners. Okay? So, if you work in a cooperative, you want to maximize the average productivity of your home. Because the average productivity is what you get to take home. Right? So, the idea for a cooperative is always maximize for a cooperative. The idea is to maximize average productivity. Average productivity of labor. So, if this firm were a cooperative, it would have chosen to have 30 employees in its roster. Okay. But if it were, let's say, a voluntary firm wherein people come and volunteer to work, or let's say it was a slavery based business wherein you can hire, suppose there's a owner of some uh, plantation who has a lot of slaves at his disposal and uh, he just wants to get the maximum out of land. He does not care. He has a lot of people who can work for him. He does not have to pay them at all. So then he is going to look at marginal productivity. He is going to maximize marginal productivity of labor. Marginal productivity becoming zero means what? After this point, any additional labor is going to reduce your productivity. So if this firm were run on the economics of slavery, it would hire 40 employees. If it would run on economics of cooperatives, it would hire 30 employees. So this is the interesting thing. Okay, So no question in an exam is going to ask you find values of L for which MPL becomes zero. It will set it up like an economic problem for a, for a slave owner. And no question is going to give you directly ask you to maximize average productivity. That is something you have to uh, figure out yourself if let's say you read in the question that this is pertaining to some cooperative. Okay. So the maths is the standard math. Going from economics to this math part is something that we have to do. So how do we go from words to equations is something that you'll have to grapple with. Okay. 
So that's one example. Throughout this course, we are going to do a bunch of other examples. We'll keep learning. It's going to be a continuous process. Now let's look at isoquants. So isoquants are basically akin to indifference curves. So these are different points of K and L at which the same amount of uh, production can happen. Okay, so these are the different points of K and L. For example, suppose your production function is Q equals to under root K L and you want to produce a quantity of L. So you can choose K L to be equal to, uh, let's say 10 comma 10, or you can take it to be 5 comma 20, or you can take it to be 20 comma 5, all these things work. So that is going to be isoforms. So this is the mathematical representation of an isoform, f of k comma l equals to q. Now, uh, marginal rate of technical substitution, this is similar to MRS. So uh, you have a quantity equals to f of k comma l. So MRT is, is going to be del f by del l upon del f by del k it is going to be equal to the slope of the isoform. Okay. So the math is here, but it is similar. Everything is similar to MRS, so I'm not going to look at that much. Diminishing MRTS, so for a product, for if isoforms look like this, as you move along the labor axis, the MRTS is going to reduce. Okay, so that is your diminishing MRTS. It is again similar to diminishing MRS if you move along uh, in different So everything till here is same. The new thing here is going to be returns to scale. So what are returns to scale? So returns to scale means that suppose I were to double all my inputs. Let's say I take twice the amount of labor and I put in twice the amount of capital. So if that happens, what happens to my output? Does it also double, does it more than double or does it less than double? So constant CRS would mean that if all inputs go T times, then the output is T times the original output. This is constant CRS. So if you double the amount of labor, double the amount of capital, the amount of output is going to be double the initial. Decreasing returns to scale means that if you, let's say, double everything. See, doubling is not important. The important thing is multiplication by T. It could be going one and a half times. It could be going three times. For whatever amount that you multiply each input with, does the output get multiplied by the same factor more than that or less than that? That is the thing. So decreasing MRTS would mean that if you multiply everything with uh, T, the total output is less than T times initial. And increasing means that if you multiply everything with T, the output gets more than T times, okay? So let's do some examples here. Suppose the production function is F equals to under root KL. So F, of tk comma tl is equals to under root tk into tl so that is equal to t times under root kl okay and f of k comma l equals to under root kl so the relationship between this the relationship between this and this gives me that f of tk comma tl is basically equal to t times f of k comma right 
So this is a constant returns to scale function. Next example is production function equals to k times n. So what do you think about this production function? Is it going to be increasing or decreasing or constant? Just multiply everything with two. That would be an easier thing. Increasing. Increasing, right? So yeah. So if you multiply everything by two, f of 2k comma 2l is going to be four times kl. Whereas f of k comma l is just, sorry, two times f of k comma l is going to be 2kl. So this thing is larger than this thing. So this is going to be increasing returns to scale. Okay. So you can look at bunch of other examples here. You can play with these numbers. You'll get different examples. The whole idea is if you have a Cobb Douglas thing, which looks like this, F equals to K to power alpha L to power one minus alpha, then this is going to be a constant returns to scale. If you have f equals to k to power alpha into L to power beta, such that alpha plus beta is greater than one, then you are going to have an increasing returns to scale. And if alpha plus beta is less than one, then you are going to have a decreasing returns to scale. Okay, so if the powers add to one, you get constant. So this is true for all the Cobb Douglas type production. There are a bunch of other types of production functions as well. So we'll not talk about that. But when they come, you can basically look at them. All right. Uh, okay. Homothetic production functions. Mm. Now, CRS production function is homogeneous of degree one. What is a function that is homogeneous of degree one? So, a function f dot is homogeneous of degree alpha if f times t x equals to t to power alpha times f of x. This is the definition of a homogeneous function. So for example, you have f of x comma y. Sorry, let's say f is equal to x y. Then f of tx comma ty will be equal to t square xy. So you need an f of x comma y will be equal to x square. Okay. So the power to t is 2. So t gets, when you multiply all inputs by t, the overall output gets multiplied by t to power. So you can say that this function is homogeneous of degree. Now, all CRS production functions, they exhibit the result that f of tx comma ty equals to t to the power 1 f of x comma y. So this power is 1. So that's why we say that all CRS production functions are homogeneous of the See, homogeneous functions are not a property of, uh, not a property of uh, economic it's a mathematical problem. Okay, so it's very widely used in maths. So we CRS is something which is relevant only to economics, constant returns to scale. So CRS production functions are going to be homogeneous of degree one. So we are going to look at some important properties of CRS production functions and why they make sense. Okay, so this part is not important for not important for uh, your exam. But it is this important to know as an economist of what, what is the beauty of this CRS production function, which makes this so endearing. 
So if you look at marginal productivity of uh, uh, capital for a CRS production function, it is going to be del F by del K when for some K and L. And this is going to be the same for del F by del K at T K comma T L. Okay. Uh, so this property comes from the fact that if F is homogeneous of degree alpha, then F prime is homogeneous of degree alpha minus one. This is the property of uh, homogeneous function. So if you differentiate a homogeneous function of degree alpha, you get a homogeneous function of degree alpha minus one. So in this case, in the second part, you assume that T is equals to one by L. So what we get is marginal productivity of capital is del F K by L comma one. So it's just a function of K by L. Okay. <clears throat> so essentially what we have is that marginal productivity of capital is a function of the ratio K by L and one. So marginal productivity of capital is only dependent on marginal productivity of capital is dependent only on the ratio k by l and not exact value of k and l so you don't need exact values of k and l if you if i give you the ratio k by l you can find marginal productivity of capital the same holds for marginal productivity of labor and your MRTS is nothing but marginal productivity of labor, which is a function of K by L upon marginal productivity of capital, which is a function of K by L. So essentially what you have is that your MRTS is only dependent on the ratio K by L and not on the actual values of K and L. So the point is that if I draw any line through the origin, it has a formula K by L equals to some value beta. This is the standard line through uh, Y equals to MX, right? So K by L equals to M. So this is the equation of a standard line through origin. Now, wherever it intersects the different, so I'm saying that these are the different ICs which intersect this particular line through the origin. At different intersection points, the slope of the ICs is going to be the same because MRTS is only a function of K by L ratio. At all these places, K by L is same. So MPL and MPK should be same. So their ratio should be same. So MRTS should be same. So what I'm basically saying is that if I draw a line through origin, the tangents at different ICs are going to be parallel to each other. This is all that I want to establish about homothetic functions for now. So all that I'm saying is that if you draw a line through the origin for a homothetic function at different ICs, wherever it intersects, the tangents to these ICs are going to be parallel to each other. So all these tangents will have a slope, common slope. Is that much clear to all of you? Okay. This next property, I don't know if it would be important or not. It just says that a production function can have homothetic indifference map even if it does not exhibit CRS. So CRS implies homotheticity. But the Converse is not necessary. Okay, so CRS implies homothetic, but homothetic does not necessarily imply CRS. <clears throat> okay, uh, so here's an example for the same. So suppose uh, F of k comma l is a crs production function 
then i take another function capital f which is small f to the power alpha all right so this function will no longer be crs but it will still obey the rules of homotheticity because this is like this is like a monotonic transformation and we saw that monotonic transformations do not change the indifference curves so monotonic transformation can change the returns to scale but it will not change the fact about homotheticity so any monotonic transformation of uh, an existing uh, uh, homothetic function will be another homothetic function the important result that you need to remember is this crs implies homotheticity the reverse the converse is not true i think jnu asked it once so this was once asked by jnu okay i want to look at cost functions but it's a relatively lengthier topic and a lot of students have left i don't want to do this right now because i want to do some problems which are going to be important okay so <clears throat> this much territory is not bad either uh, what you guys need to do is start with the problem set and the past years okay so i want you to start working with the past years i am guessing for for first part okay for the first part of the super theory so i'm guessing you guys would have all done these uh, six chapters sometime over these uh, this uh, week i'll take a discussion session on demand okay all the others have been uh, done one to five are done sixth chapter is something i will do so i want you all to uh, do these problems and then uh, we can look at uh, uh, after this we will be looking at these past years like i told you okay, so there are a lot of past years here i have already shared the solutions with all of you i think for past years if i have not do message me your gmail id i'll share the past year solutions with you so that you can go through the past years and uh, and uh, that will save time for discussion okay i'm sorry i'm a little tired because i had two lectures today and then in between i had a seminar so i feel like we should stop today yeah <clears throat> uh so i'll see you guys most probably monday or tuesday for the doubt session and then we'll do uh, the lectures next saturday all right uh so ending the class now bye guys thank you sir. thank you sir welcome